Tonight on KQED Newsroom, special guest E. Joaquin Esquivel, the chair of California's Water Resources Board, discusses the state's severe drought conditions. Plus, California has new protections in place for warehouse worker safety and abortion access. We'll talk through the latest political action with our expert panel. And we take a moment to linger in one of San Francisco's waterfront parks in this week's look at something beautiful. Coming to you from KQED headquarters in San Francisco, this Friday, September 24th, 2021. Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. Let's kick off our show with the Friday Five, a look at some of the top news stories in California. First, the entire state is in a drought, and nearly 90% of California is facing what's known as extreme or exceptional drought. In July, Governor Newsom said we should all voluntarily reduce our water use by 15%, but so far, we've only managed to reduce our usage by 1.8%. Governor Newsom signed multiple bills into law this week. One was a $15 billion climate package he signed while visiting Sequoia National Forest, including funds for forest health and fighting wildfires. Just since 2020, six of the seven largest wildfires have occurred in California history. Just this year, we have experienced another devastating wildfire season. 2.35 million acres have burned so far this year, and I say so far because I California continues to have the lowest coronavirus case rate in the nation. On Thursday, Oakland Unified became the first school district in Northern California to mandate vaccines for students 12 and older. The city of San Francisco is testing a new pilot program to reduce homelessness. They're replacing tents, which are currently in a designated safe sleeping area, with tiny homes, each with about 64 square feet of living space. San Francisco is following in the footsteps of Oakland, San Jose, and other cities, which have put up small, portable homes in the past several years. And a record number of cargo ships have been stuck waiting to unload in Southern California ports in Los Angeles and Long Beach. The pandemic has led to a boom in buying goods, but the state's port facilities can't handle all the additional inbound ship traffic, which is expected to lead to a slowdown in the supply chain. And that's this week's Friday Five coming up. We'll have a deep dive interview about the drought with the person in charge of California's water resources. But first, it's time to talk politics. This week, Governor Newsom signed bills regulating worker protections, addressing climate change, and strengthening women's access to abortion services, while speculation grew over the governor's future political ambitions in the wake of his decisive recall victory. Meanwhile, the California GOP is gearing up for its annual convention happening this weekend. Joining us now to discuss the state's latest political happenings are Katie Orr, who reports for KQED's Politics and Government Desk from Sacramento. Hello, Katie. Hi, Priya. And Mark Z. Baraback, a columnist for the LA Times, focusing on California politics. Hello, Mark. Hi there. So welcome to the show, Katie. Let's start with you. Let's turn to the pair of bills Newsom signed related to the privacy of abortion providers and patients. And this comes in the wake of the new law in Texas that bans abortion after six weeks. I want to hear about those bills, but first let's hear what the governor had to say with this. Is we're reaffirming uh, the constitutionally protected and fundamental rights of women uh, to uh, have these safe uh, and accessible uh, reproductive and sexual health care that they deserve. So, Katie, what's in these bills? Well, it's basically like you said. Um, they're really aimed at protecting the privacy of both women who receive abortions and also the providers and staff and volunteers who work to help those women, uh, help those women and give them care. Um, I think what's really interesting about this is it's just such a stark illustration of the split in our country. Uh, California mm -hmm. is going in one direction in terms of giving women more protections and uh, giving providers more protections as well, versus, like you mentioned, a state like Texas, where basically anybody can sue someone if they believe they are helping a woman get an abortion. Uh, it's just another example, again, of how divided this country is. 
Uh, and California, of course, has many abortion protections, and I would not be surprised uh, to see the state uh, keep getting more in the years to come. Yeah, so what does this say about Governor Newsom and how he's positioning himself and, and the state on the national stage? Mark. Well, uh, I think it's a doubling down of, of where the state has been. California has always been a, a pro-choice state, so no surprise there. As I said, a, a sort of doubling down. Uh, the question, where does Gavin Newsom go from here? Well, first, he's got to get through a gubernatorial re-elect next year, I, I think. Which I, I seems I don't make any pretty... Predictions. Yeah, I don't make any predictions. But, look, unless he goes back to the French laundry and signs legislation to, like, open up the whole state to offshore oil drilling, I think he's a pretty safe bet for re-election. So... Where does he go from here? Well, there's only one job bigger, if you will, than, than California governor, and that's the White House. And I see this movie a lot of times. You could be sure after this, you know, crushing victory in the recall, he will be talking up Gavin Newsom 2024, assuming Joe Biden doesn't run again. Gavin Newsom 2028. There's one problem. We have a vice president from California by the name of Kamala Harris, who, like her or not, is the overwhelming front runner when if Joe Biden doesn't run, to be a successor. So to get where he may want to go eventually, Gavin Newsom would have to get around his, his, his old friend and rival from San Francisco, Kamala Harris. You did note in an article this week, though, Mark, that Gavin Newsom is pretty young and that time is really on his side. That is true. That is true. He could be, he could, he could run for president in 2044 when, when who knows what we'll be talking about that week, 2044, and he would still be younger than Joe Biden was when he was sworn into office this January. So time is definitely on his side. Well, you know, the way I, it's been... I do yeah, go ahead, Katie. Wonder, I mean, looking back, and there was talk of Newsom and Kamala Harris sort of making an agreement that she would go for Senate and he would go for the governor's office. Uh, you have to wonder if he's kind of looking back on that and saying, oh, man, I made the wrong choice. Is well, there yeah, a chance that he might find really his funny. way? They are sort of... Uh, the word frenemies has been used. There has been this competition. They're both from San Francisco, share a lot of the same donors, share the same political strategies. So they have a very interesting relationship. I, I, I've likened it to siblings in the sense that there's a rivalry, there's envy. They're there when the other needs each other. But I know from having spoken with people close to both of them that, you know, they didn't mind too much when the other had to squirm a little bit when Kamala's presidential campaign kind of went mm -hmm. south on her, uh, when Gavin had to face his recall election. There was, they were there for each other, but there also was a little bit of sitting back and taking maybe a little pleasure in seeing the other ones have to squirm some. Do either of you see a pathway for the governor to move into that Senate seat at some point? I, he could appoint himself if he wanted to. Uh, I don't know that he would necessarily do that because I think it would kind of feed into this image that he has, the, the image problem that he has, that he is a bit of an elitist, that he's, uh, you know, only in it to, for himself. Uh, again, that's just what certain people say. Of course, the, the French Laundry dinner didn't help that situation. So uh -huh. I feel like he might be pretty hesitant to do that. All right, Mark, anything else on the governor's political future you want to add here before we move on? I would just say, you know, who knows? Senator Feinstein, is she going to run for re-election to age 91? I don't think so. So that might open up the Senate seat if the governor's looking to move on and do something in Washington. All right. So, Katie, there's one more set of bills I want to ask you about, and these are linked to worker rights. So this week, Governor Newsom signed AB 701, which provides more protection to warehouse workers, but he vetoed the other one, AB 616, which would have allowed farm workers to vote by mail in union elections. So why on earth would he have vetoed the right for anyone to vote by mail? He didn't offer very much explanation. He just felt that the bill, you know, wasn't where it needed to be, that he should, you know, they should go back and work on it a little bit more. I think, though, that uh, this is probably troubling for labor unions. They worked incredibly hard to help him beat back the recall process. They raised millions of dollars. They had tens of thousands of volunteers. I mean, made millions of phone calls, all of that. And so for one of the first actions for Newsom to take after he beats this recall uh, to be vetoing a bill that they wanted, they're not happy with that. And in fact, mm -hmm. uh, the group that was uh, the labor union that was most behind this bill had planned a march to Sacramento to try and commemorate a march that Cesar Chavez had taken. And once uh, Gov Governor Newsom vetoed this bill, they switched directions and ended up marching to the French Laundry instead. So that kind of tells you, you know, how happy they were with 
with that veto. The French laundry is going to be a flagpole for a while, it sounds like. Mark, Absolutely. what other fallout are you seeing post-recall? Um, unions a little bit unhappy. What about all this talk about reforming the recall? Yeah, I, I did well. <clears throat> now that I'm a columnist, I can venture these sorts of opinions. And, and to quote myself, the day after the, the recall, I wrote a column saying I think it was a complete and utter waste. I mean, $276 million for an election that basically left us where we started. The winning, if you will, margin, Gavin Newsom got 62% nearly matches, I'm sorry, 63% rejected it nearly matches the 62% he got when he ran for governor four years ago. Look, if you don't like Gavin Newsom, if you don't like his hair or his teeth or the French laundry or his policies regarding abortion or whatever, we have an election. We've always had an election nine months from now that people could have waited and voted. To me, it was a colossal waste of time. And I think it's a system that is rife for abuse. I think it's a system that is rife for reform. I also did a column this week up in Santa Rosa. You had a, a wealthy developer. Uh, his nursing home company paid a $500,000 fine. A bunch of old folks were abandoned during the 2017 fire. A month after agreeing to pay that fine, he kicks off a recall. He spent almost $2 million to try and recall the DA. Hmm. Um, she survived the recall, but he spent a lot of money on signatures. So things like bounties for signatures. I mean, look, you can get a ham and cheese sandwich on the ballot if you pay enough money to signature gather. So hmm. I think our experience this last go round shows that the recall is really, really ready for a revamp. Well, the California GOP convention is starting today in San Diego, and I can imagine that there's going to be a lot of hand wringing and finger pointing. Katie, what are you expecting to see there? Well, it's kind of funny that the theme for their convention is um, Ford together. <laughs> and they did not come together in the recall election. Uh, the California GOP made a um, a decision not to endorse any candidate in that race because they were afraid of alienating voters who might not agree with that endorsement. And so you could argue that they gave up a chance to unite behind a more moderate candidate, someone like former San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner. And because the message was so spread out, we saw Larry Elder come out of, you know, basically nowhere. He got into the race relatively late and really take all the oxygen out of it. And towards the end, as uh, reporters started looking into him a little bit more, he had so many controversial opinions coming forward that he just doesn't, he's not palatable to most Californians. So the GOP in California kind of missed an opportunity to uh, try and replant their flag. And now they're going into their convention and they're really going to have to figure out how they want to go forward because Trumpism doesn't appeal to enough people in California to make them successful. Mm -hmm. and, and Mark, I, I would say, too, yeah. you know, I think the, the Republican Party in California is, is really verging on, on irrelevancy, which is, a, which is a bad thing. I know I write for the LA Times. People figure probably off camera I have a whole shelf of Marxist-Leninist literature. Uh, I, I don't. I think we need a vibrant, competitive two-party system in California so one holds the other in check. We don't have that in California right now, and I don't think that's good for California. I don't think that's good for democracy. Okay, Mark, let's change the subject for our last little look here. Catch us up on the latest in the Los Angeles mayor's race. At least one new candidate declared this week. Tell us about the importance of this race for the state, and is this race wide open? Well, big development. Uh, Kevin DeLeon, who was a former state Senate president, ran against Dianne Feinstein, speaking of, a loss to her, announced earlier this week he was a candidate for L.A. mayor, and then Karen Bass. A uh, member of Congress who's been mentioned for a lot of things. She's been mentioned as a possible successor to Nancy Pelosi as Speaker. She was on Joe Biden's shortlist. She got in. She got into the race. It is. It is a wide open race. I mean, the inner the, the position of LA mayor is an interesting one in that it is what it is not what you call a strong mayor. A lot of the power, much of the power, rests with the city council. But, but hey. You're mayor of the second biggest city in the United States. It's a very, very big megaphone. I mean, interestingly, it's been a dead end of sorts. We haven't had a, a there's never been an LA mayor who's, who's been elected governor. It's been a kind of political dead end until recently. Eric Garcetti didn't get the cabinet post he wanted, but was just appointed uh, ambassador to India. So again, very, very big platform, very big megaphone being mayor of the second biggest city in the country. We have time to squeeze one more in. And, Katie, I want to talk about this conflict within the Democratic Party. San Diego Congressional Democrat Representative Scott Peters, he's opposed to a new prescription drug plan that's being advanced by the Democratic leadership. Can you tell us about this conflict? Right. Um, this bill would give the government more leverage in directly negotiating prices, and it would also uh, allow the government to penalize drug companies that raise the prices of drugs too fast. Uh, 
Scott Peters was one of just a handful of Democrats to vote against this legislation, which is being backed by, uh, as you mentioned, Democratic leadership. Um, of course, Scott Peters represents a portion of San Diego that has a lot of biotech companies, life science companies that rely a lot on pharmaceutical development. Uh, he has been criticized for taking money from phar pharmaceutical companies. However, he thinks uh, he has said that this bill would hurt investment in those companies. Okay. And so he uh, has not supported it. All right. Katie Orr with KQED. Mark Baraback with the L.A. Times. Thank you both for your insight. You're the Golden State is 100 percent in severe drought. Hundreds of wells are running dry and reservoir levels are well below historic averages with no relief in sight. Water suppliers have warned that major cuts are likely for tens of millions of Californians. One high level state water official put it bluntly this week, stating the challenge is there is no water. Joining us now to discuss the drought is the chair of California's Water Resources Board, E. Joaquin Esquivel. Mr. Esquivel, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. So good to be with you. And you can call me Joaquin, please. All right. Well, Joaquin, could you give us some context? We know this drought is very severe, but California has gone through dry spells before. So how does this one compare to past droughts? Yeah, we certainly have gone through droughts before, but this drought is on the heels of our most recent historic drought in 2015. And in many ways, our communities have, haven't simply haven't recovered from that last drought. And in fact, what we're seeing is just an intense drying of our watershed and our, and, and our lands, which is meaning that these droughts are, are more intense. And we look at the last 20 years and the occurrence of above average and or dry years is more than, than not. And so we're seeing a, a continual trend of drying, if you will, in our watersheds, which is really having impacts here on our reservoirs. Usually we have what's called a runoff efficiency, meaning that uh, as snow melts, as, as rain uh, precipitates onto the land, about 60% of that makes its way into our rivers and our reservoirs. Um, this year, what we saw was a runoff efficiency of about 20%, meaning only about 20% of that rain, that snow melt, made it into our reservoirs, which created a huge deficit and a challenge for managing our, our resources this year. So how worried are you about this drought? How worried should we be? We should be concerned. We need to be concerned because we need to be planning now for continued dry conditions going here into the winter. And, but I will say, you know, I, especially someone, a millennial here, someone from my generation where climate anxiety is real. This, you know, between wildfires, this drought, and the challenges that the climate crisis, crisis are, are creating for our communities, it can seem um, a little overwhelming, uh, a little anxious inducing. So I want to say yes, uh, you know, I, I am concerned. It does, it does certainly uh, keep me up a bit. But we also have here in California a history of, of, of adapting to a, a very varied hydrology where this boom and bust cycle between droughts and floods uh, have always been a feature of, of California's hydrology, but we know they're going to get a lot worse with climate change. We know that they're, they're here to stay. These droughts will grow deeper and longer, and, and the, the, the floods that we will be facing, the flashier uh, sort of system that we have now means that we need to start making investments in our, our, our water systems in ways, again, that California has, but we'll need to really in, accelerate those in order to be able to adapt to this changing climate that we have. So when you talk about investment, Governor Newsom just signed a package of climate bills, which will bring $15 billion worth of investment to the state. $5 billion of that is going towards drought resilience. So tell me specifically, what kinds of investment is the state going to make to help us have a brighter future when it comes to our water usage? Yeah, thank you. Under the leadership of the governor, we developed what we call the water resiliency portfolio here in the state of California, and it lays out the, the investments and the actions we need to be taking to build resiliency to drought and flood here in the state. That includes recycling water, continuing to expand our recycled water portfolio, continuing to capture stormwater and ensure that we put that to beneficial use, and continuing to ensure that we're recharging our groundwater supplies so that they're there for future droughts and ensuring that we're able to, to manage across these extremes in our, our climate. Do you have some way of measuring how much that package overall is going to help, what that portfolio is going to do? Yeah, I know that over the 
last, just say five years, uh, we've invested about a billion dollars into water recycling projects. That's an additional 62,000 acre feet of water. And I know an acre foot can seem uh, kind of a, an austere or, or it's odd number to try to understand, but it supports you know, nearly 200,000 homes water use a year. So um, it's a significant uh, amount in the recycling water side that can actually really uh, help communities stretch their supplies and make them more drought resilient. And how are we using our water in the state right now? Your job is actually to oversee who gets how much of California's water, if it's going to agricultural use or hydroelectric power or to urban communities. So how is it typically divvied up? It really depends uh, on the water year, how much uh, what it goes to different sectors or how much is used uh, uh, between groundwater or surface water. But generally, about 50 percent of the rain and snow that falls onto the state um, is is left in the environment, mainly in our, our wet northern rivers that, that are free-flowing, they aren't dammed. The rest of it, what we have con, uh, control over, about uh, uh, 40 percent of that goes to, to ag and then about 20 percent to the urban sector. And is that still the same even in drought years? Because I know there's a lot of concern about how much water goes towards agriculture. It, it can shift. Um, and I don't have exact numbers of, of how much it, it does shift, but the importance of sharing between the agricultural sector and the urban sector is really important. Uh, and we see that you know, places in Southern California, like the Imperial Irrigation District, have, have shared uh, their agricultural water with uh, urban agencies like San Diego. So one of the pieces of news that came out this week was that we haven't done very well overall in reducing our water use voluntarily. The average drop turns out to have been just 2 percent during the period we're looking at, which is the month of July. But when you peel back the layers, there's a lot of variation by region. So here in San Francisco, for example, there was an 8 percent drop in use in Sonoma and Healdsburg. They put mandatory restrictions in place and they dropped their use by 30 to 50 percent. How were these counties able to save so much water? You look at the last drought and Californians know how to conserve. And it was actually a really critical tool of getting us through the last dry conditions. And in fact, Californians statewide are still conserving about 17% since the last drought. That savings is creating real drought resilience now. And we see, and importantly, we see uh, communities responding to their local drought conditions and places like the Russian River, where we do see more of a conservation response, it's because we were working in those watersheds back in April. So you see that response. But importantly, it's, it's important to note it takes time for conservation to boot up. Uh, we saw that in the last drought. Um, and, and here, it's why we're really needing to focus on uh, every Californian doing their part here and contributing to what are some really challenging circumstances we're finding ourselves in with this drought. What we're seeing, though, when we look at those numbers are that in Southern California overall, there wasn't any drop in usage. And 40 percent of the water suppliers in the area actually used more water than in the previous year. So should those of us in Northern California be a little frustrated with those in the southern half of the state? Yeah, I think it's it's friendly and hopeful and, and, and uh, helpful to have uh, competition here amongst Californians and regions when it comes to conservation. Uh, but I'll think, I also think it's important to remember that if you look at per capita numbers, Southern California is still doing a, a good bit better than some of our Northern California communities. Uh, it's obvious, though, that just in this last year, Southern California hasn't really started to boot up the conservation that we need to be seeing. So we're, we're, we're looking to make sure that we, we stay focused on the numbers and the outcomes here. Um, and, and yes, uh, you know, uh, friendly competition between uh, communities is, is helpful. What's in your blueprint for the state? I think we really need to recognize that we've built our water systems out in the 20th century for a 20th century hydrology. And we're in the 21st century with a 21st century climate crisis. So we need to adapt those systems at the watershed scale. So how we collect water and, and distribute it, but also in the urban sector and in our homes, being more wise with our and efficient with our use and continuing to make investments in things like water recycling, stormwater capture, and groundwater recharge that are going to ex expand our portfolio. I think the blueprint really is about just getting more data specific and using uh, the, the, the tools and technologies here of the 21st century to really modernize the way we view our water resources, the way we manage them across sectors, and importantly, uh, continue to use data 
as the, the linchpin uh, for, for how we view uh, our, our, our water systems here into the future. And very quickly before we go, do you think we will be seeing mandatory water restrictions? And if so, when? I think that as we continue to, to plan for another dry year and we see how, how Californians are responding to the call to conserve, um, there'll be a point here in, in the winter as we, as we move into the next water year to really evaluate, to see if Californians are conserving, if we're, if we're at the right uh, uh, place when, when it comes to being prepared for, for continued dry conditions, and if not, uh, needing to see uh, state action. But at this point, I think we see some, some indications that, uh, as, as you see, some, some variability in, in, in responses across the state. But Californians know how to conserve. Uh, this isn't the first drought that we've been through. And, and you know, proudly, I think uh, Californians will rise to this one as well. All right. E. Joaquin Esquivel, chair of the California Water Resources Board. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you so much. At the end of the Hyde Street cable car line in San Francisco is Aquatic Park. It's a national historic landmark and where we'll be heading for this week's look at something beautiful. There, you'll find people swimming in the protected lagoon and a park with views of Ghirardelli Square, Alcatraz, and the Golden Gate Bridge. And that's the end of our show for tonight. Thank you for joining us. If you want to get a look behind the scenes, then please connect with us online too. KQED Newsroom is on Twitter and Facebook. You can email us at knr at kqed.org. And you can reach me on Twitter at Priya D. Clemens. We'll see you right back here next Friday night. Have a great weekend.